get over that of North Korea. <laughs> All right? And I've served on jury duty. Uh, it's actually a fascinating process. And uh, for those of you who have tried to weasel, I mean, get out of jury duty, uh, I know it can be problematic, but it, it, it is a good way to serve. But I remember thinking, man, some of these folks, I don't know if I want to call them a jury of my peers. This lady has fallen asleep during the trial. But uh, reliable testimony is so critical in having a justice system that has any worth to it whatsoever. Valid testimony is ne necessary in more than just courtrooms, though. Valid testimony is something quite essential for everyday life. In fact, for any of you who have been an employer and someone says, hey, I'm vouching for this person, he or she will be a good employee. To a degree there, you're giving testimony concerning the person's character, and you hope that on the second day of the job, they don't show up 30 minutes late, and you're going like, what, I have to be here on time? Because that's a bad reflection of who spoke for the person. And there are other areas where valid testimony is a benefit, but we won't go into those. Unfortunately, there is a reality that not all testimony, especially during a court case, is reliable people do lie under oath now there's a serious penalty if you're caught and yet still sometimes people do bear false witness but we use testimony to try to come to the best conclusion that we can come to I remember serving on a, a jury pool years and years ago and during this particular trial, it was actually of a pretty severe graphic nature where there was a brawl and a violent attack. And the jury was escorted from the courtroom for a portion of testimony. And I thought, well, I don't know what we're missing. But you know what? That's not what we're ruling on either. And what we were not allowed to hear might have turned our vote the other way. But we could only make the judgment based upon the testimony we were allowed to hear. Um, that, that's just one of the ways our justice system goes. But you're taking the testimony and, and weighing, is this valid or, wow, you know, he said this but then turned right around and said that. I don't know if his testimony is reliable. And you're doing this, again, to try to come to a right conclusion. Well, today we're looking at the testimony of a man named John the Baptist concerning who he is and who he isn't. And ultimately, John is trying to point people away from himself and to point them to someone greater. Someone who stands among you, even now. I want you to try your best to have the mindset of many of those early Jews as you hear and think about this text they eagerly awaited the Messiah. And for centuries, the Jews were awaiting the Messiah. But there seemed to be this building anticipation. So that's present. People want to know, when, when is he coming? Where is he? And in verse 28, you find that this particular um, incident, if you will, occurs in Bethany across the Jordan. That's across the Jordan River. I think this is significant at least to this degree, there is a Bethany that's but a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem, and that doesn't seem to be the Bethany spoken of here. This is a Bethany a few miles further out. There's some debate that it's not even called Bethany, but I'm not going into that. But it's a few miles away, and it's out in a wilderness. Now, why do I think that's important? Because you've got this preacher who is nothing to look at that you said, man, he's styling and profiling. I mean, if you all, th and I'm wearing a sweater, this is super dressed up for me. You know, I just, this is big time dressed up. If y'all would let me preach in a tunic, I would. Uh, and I could, I don't know what that would do to people. But, but John looks like some guy that you don't want to encounter in the woods. He's probably got locust wings hanging out, you know, his mouth where he's been eating some of those and some honey on it. No, he's probably not that bad. But who is this guy dressed like the prophet Elijah, which is an interesting parallel, out in the middle of nowhere 
and everybody is going to hear him. You can imagine those Jewish leaders in Jerusalem are like, why is attendance down today? Well, they're all out in Judea hearing this guy who's eating bugs and honey and wears camel hair. What? Yeah, they're all going out there. So you might see where there's a reason for intrigue. Now let's look at the text this morning. I want to do this in two sections. First, in verses 19 to 23, there's, there's two major points this morning, and I'll do the first one from verses 19 to 23. Um, this is John the Baptist and his testimony concerning himself. John's testimony concerning him, himself. We're not only going to hear his testimony concerning who the Messiah is, but who John isn't. So, look at verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ or the Messiah, the Anointed One. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Verse 22, So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? I love verse 23. He said, and remember, the Jewish ear is going to pick up on this because it's a quote from Isaiah. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. And that might sound simple to your and my ears, but it's not a simple statement. And we're going to get there. But John, are you telling us that the prophet Isaiah, 700 years ago, speaking about the forerunner to the Messiah, that's you? That's me. Let's dive in. John's testimony concerning himself, word about him has made its way all the way to the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And at no point do we see John promoting himself. As best we know, he didn't have a YouTube page. He wasn't on Spotify like famous fellowship, uh, Grace Fellowship pastors are. I mean, again, reaching tens of homes. He's just doing what God sent him to do out in the middle of the wilderness. And the people are showing up. And it wasn't the, a trendy thing. I think part of it, whenever you look at the Jewish leaders and they did not know Jesus, they did not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. We know that as we will go throughout the story. But you can have people in official religious positions with titles, dead men trying to preach about dead religion. Can you imagine where people might be like, this is dead and I'm done with it. And then you hear some guy out in the middle of the wilderness saying, preaching, repent it. You need to repent. Whoa, he's not trying to tickle my ears. He's not trying to appease me. No, you're a hopeless sinner and there's a God who came or there's a God who is and he can rescue you. Repent. And people responded. It breaks and saddens my heart. To look at the church in the United States of America especially, where we have had such an abundance of theological training, and churches by the masses are pursuing programs to get people to come. Why? So we can have our attendance and our budget, and what, send them out as dead as they came in? Well, yeah, so long as we uphold to our traditions, and as long as we, you know, Fill the, the seats, if you will. I don't think that's what God was describing when he talked about the living church. And now you've got a man who comes in and says, I'm simply here to tell you the word of God. And it will confront you, but it will encourage you. And it's what you need to hear, even if it's not what you want to hear. That's John the Baptist to a far more stern degree. The Jewish leaders have got to inquire, who is this man? So, they send some priests and Levites out to ask John about his identity. Now, was this mere curiosity? Was it messianic curiosity? Or, or was it, we feel threatened? I lean to think it was more about threat. 
But I could be wrong. It's happened on a couple of billion occasions. But nonetheless, they want to know, who are you? So they, they send these, these men to ask John. And I want to consider for a moment, why do they want to know about John's identity? Well, as I said in the introductory notes, it's possible that they're curious about these large crowds leaving Jerusalem and going out to the desolation area or the desolate area and hearing this country rogue preacher. Yet that curiosity is, is enough that they actually are going to do something about it. And by their own questioning of him saying, who are you? Uh, it is possible that they want to know are you claiming to be the Christ? Others before John had made that claim. And folks, if, if you're looking for someone, you've got this history being the people of the living God, knowing what that God said in the Garden of Eden to Adam, Eve, and the devil about the one who would come and be bruised, but then crush the, the serpent. Is that you? Are you finally here? Our people have waited for centuries and centuries. Are you finally here? <laughs> Could it be? And they had that kind of anticipation. Well, John's confession is this. I am not. And I don't know if that just let all of the air out of the balloon or what, but he says, I am not the Christ. I I, it's not me. I'm not the one that God was speaking of in Genesis chapter 3. And then the delegation of priests and Levites ask him, well then are you Elijah? I'm not trying to make anyone feel dumb. But if you don't read the Old Testament and read it well, this is not, oh, seminary trained Daryl looking down on people. No, that's a simple observation of the biblical illiteracy that is rampant in Protestant churches. I'm not even talking about people outside of the church. I'm talking about people in the church who you said, man, name me five of the Old Testament books. And they'd be like, Matthew, Paul. You're like, what? If you don't know the Old Testament, you're missing out. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. The law and the prophets, which is, a, is referring to the Old Testament, I've come to fulfill it. The Old Testament is still good. And when you not only read it, but know how it's put together, you start reading the New Testament, you're like, oh my goodness. A light comes on and you're like, give me more of that Bible. <laughs> you're no longer afraid to turn to the book of Obadiah. Or some of you, I thought it was Obadiah. Uh, no. You're not afraid to go to 2 Kings. In fact, you go there with anticipation of, God, what will you say, what, what will you remind me of today? In the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah was revered by many and he was recognized, even by opponents, as a true prophet of Yahweh or the Lord. But there was also something about Elijah that the prophet Malachi tells us of. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Malachi, right before those 400 years of silence, says, Messiah is still coming, but Elijah is coming first. Now, for the person who says, wait, is that a reincarnation? No, there is no such thing as reincarnation. But even if there was, that would be problematic for Elijah. Anyone know why? Because he didn't die. <laughs> There's no death for him to be reincarnated from, which again, there is no reincarnation, all right? That's myth. Um, but Elijah is the one who will come before the Messiah steps onto the scene. Well, that, that's going to be the heart behind the, are you Elijah? See, otherwise you're reading this, you're like, why do they ask him that? That doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. Again, if you know the storyline. Now, for those of you sitting here saying, well, I don't know the storyline that well, so obviously I shouldn't listen. No, I want to encourage you, man, if you don't know, start knowing. Get in the book. Get a, I, I like the ESV study Bible. I like the MacArthur study Bible. Uh, those are just two but it's not too late to get in there and start learning and figuring it out 
and coming and hearing us teach and preach, we, we try to do that too in helping people understand the scriptures. But Malachi is talking about Elijah will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now there's two things here. Whenever the Old Testament prophets talk about the day of the Lord, there's one day in the future which is the ultimate final day of the Lord when God is going to come and there's, there's no more escaping. But we see glimpses of the day of the Lord like when God brings the northern kingdom to its knees by the Assyrians in 722. We see that with the southern kingdom of Judah when the Babylonians conquer them in 586 B.C. We see these, quote, days of the Lord that are bad, but they're not as bad as it will be, and they're pictures of what's coming. Well, in connection to that end-time thinking, Malachi says, Elijah is coming before the Messiah. Okay. So are you, are you Elijah? John says, I am not. Now this is where you can get into a little bit, uh, not, not trouble, but in Luke chapter 1 verse 17, an angel of the Lord shows up to a man named Zacharias, who is a Levite, who is a priest. And he's an old man. And he says, you and your wife are going to have a baby. It's very similar to Abraham, right? And you will name him John. And he will be the one to go before the Messiah. He will be that voice crying in the wilderness. That's Luke 1, 17. He will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's the real connection. John the Baptist is not the prophet Elijah. These are two different people. Now, the problem comes when you hear Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, where Jesus says that John is Elijah. What, what's the issue? Is, is the Bible contradictory there? Is Jesus wrong? Of course not. Well, is the Scripture wrong? Of course not. What's he talking about? John is not a reincarnated Elijah. John is one coming in the spirit and power of Elijah just like the Old Testament said he would come before the Messiah makes himself known. So this is that testimony. Are you the Christ? I am not. Well, are you Elijah? I am not. Then the delegation asks, are you Again, this is where it helps to know the Old Testament. What is that in reference to? Well, you might have heard of a man named Moses. Right? One of the key figures in the Old Testament. When you look at Moses, the first 40 years of his life there in Egypt, he thinks that God has called him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, which God had, but it wasn't time yet. So he tries and then has to flee, and God takes him to the desert to shepherd sheep for 40 years in preparation for him shepherding his people for 40 years. Well, Moses disobeyed God at this one point where it was involving a stick and a rock. And at one time God said, strike it, and water came forth from it. Well, God comes back to that a different day, and this time says, speak to it. Well, Moses strikes it again. And now people think it's a magic stick and a magic rock rather than the power of God. And God says, what you did was huge. And because of it, I'm not going to let you go into Canaan, the promised land. I'll let you see it, but you will not go in. In fact, Moses even says, why can't I go? And God says, don't ask me about it anymore. Okay. Well, in Deuteronomy, which is, I think, the Old Testament book that Jesus quotes from the most. Any of you spending a lot of time in Deuteronomy? A lot of, well, Greg, okay. Greg. I love it too. Deuteronomy is basically five sermons. It's the last five sermons that Moses will preach. Words of a dying man to a people getting ready to enter into a land that God promised centuries before. And at one point in that section known as Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, Moses says, The Lord, Yahweh, He's going to raise up a prophet from among you. Not just any mere man, but the one who's the true prophet. God. God. That's who they were looking to. John, are you the prophet that Moses was referring to back in Deuteronomy? And John says, I am not. Now, was John a prophet? Yeah. But he's not the prophet. That title goes to the Messiah. 
And John has made it very clear, I am not the Messiah. Well, after being pushed further, John finally comes out and tells them, I'll tell you exactly who I am. Look again there in verse 23. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. When you study Isaiah, most of Isaiah is pretty dark. A lot of judgment. The last section, which is the lesser section, is much about hope, messianic hope. And Isaiah is telling the people of the southern kingdom known as Judah, the day is coming, Messiah will, is still going to come, just like God said he would, but God is going to send a forerunner, someone to make the way straight for him. John the Baptist says, that's who I am. So now we're getting serious. Okay, you're not the Christ, not Elijah, you're not the prophet referred to by Moses, but you are the exact one that Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 40? Yes. Well, then that means that uh, here. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> Imagine the Jew going, are you messing with us? Or are you telling the truth? I'm telling you the truth. I'm the voice in the wilderness crying out. And by the way, I wanted to do this, but I said, no, the text actually, it's better to break it up. Next Sunday, Lord willing, <laughs> that's when John says, behold the Lamb of God. There he is, right there. <laughs> and even in this morning's text, there is one who stands among you. But John says, I'm that voice crying out in the wilderness. So who I point you to is the Messiah. That, that's huge. That's a huge claim. Big time claim. And Elijah, or excuse me, John the Baptist just made that claim. So this is point one. Before you say, well, Daryl, this is interesting. I hope you would say that at least. Rather than saying, this has been dreadfully boring. Why did I come to church today? No, this is interesting, but Daryl, what in the world does this have to do with me following Jesus today? Okay, good question. Consider again the necessity of credible testimony. And I want to encourage those of you who are Christians to know the Bible better, to know the storyline better, not just... Don't, don't look at Scripture with an agenda. People do that all the time and they mess it up and you can get in real trouble there. Whenever you start agenda teaching and preaching, you are off track. Get on track. When every message or preaching that you do comes back to one issue of like, you know, I think that uh, it, it's this particular thing, man, it has nothing, little or nothing to do with the text. Get back on to the text. Too much preaching today is agenda preaching where I have what I want to talk about and I'm going to use some scripture because I need some, but I'm going to leave the scripture to get my point across. No. You take the text and draw from it what God has said and teach that and trust God with the, the application of it. Not, well, people need to hear this from me. They probably don't. They need to hear the text, not your thoughts about the end of the world or your thoughts about political controversy. They need the Word of God, not your and my agenda teaching and preaching. So let this encourage us to get in the Bible to know the Scriptures, not just to go in there and pull verses out of context. I was talking with April yesterday. By the way, y'all, she feels terrible today. Um, I don't know if it's meanness, sin, or just physical stuff. But <laughs> wait, this isn't live, so I'm okay, and hopefully she won't watch it on YouTube. Uh, now, she is, she is just really under the weather. But we were talking yesterday. I said, I feel like such a killjoy sometimes. I feel like I'm, I'm this guy who just comes in and corrects people, not because I know so much, because I don't, but there's such bad application of theology in the Bible that it's, it's too easy not to just tear apart. I mean, you, you take this verse, and yes, I'm stepping off from my notes, and this is where my wife gets nervous, but I'm going to do it anyway. You take a verse from the Old Testament that is probably on more plaques than John 3.16, Jeremiah 29.11. 
I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And that's a great passage. But I usually run across people saying that passage, and I'm like, now do you know what's going on when those words were spoken? Huh? -uh. What do you think it means? Well, God's going to prosper me. Okay, what does that mean? Well, he's, you know, I'm going to get a better job and a bigger house, and wife's going to love me more, kids are going to be more obedient. You might want to read Jeremiah 28. You might want to read Jeremiah 1 through 29 before you get to that verse. Why? Because that verse is spoken to a people that God says, I'm, a, I'm taking you into exile. I'm about to discipline you harshly, and I'm prospering you. Well, that doesn't feel like prosperity. God's going to sober you up and get your attention again, and that's better than any amount of money will do you. Amen. Now, the plaques are fine. Don't go home in shame going, I need to take that plaque down. No! Just understand the context. But when we start going into the Bible and picking verses out of their context, we can do very bad things with them. We can misunderstand them and then misapply them and then teach, them, teach those things to people, and they start doing the same thing. Be very careful when you teach the Word of God to people. Be very careful. Point two. This is John the Baptist's testimony concerning the Messiah or the Christ from verses 24 to 28. Referring to that delegation back in verse 19, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. I love this. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, I'm not going to, to elaborate further on verse 28. That's why I did it at the beginning, simply saying that John's out in the wilderness, and yet throngs of people are going out to hear him. But let's consider his testimony concerning the Messiah. The Pharisees are behind this delegation of Levites and priests being sent to John. Baptism was not an informal thing to the Jews. It wasn't just some casual thing, and it shouldn't be casual to us either. But the real issue was this. By what or whose authority are you doing this? If you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, then why are you baptizing? Why, who gave you this authority? Now, there, there might be some sincerity there because that's a valid question. There might be some jealousy there because of how many people are now not listening to those people in Jerusalem and are now listening to John. Maybe a combination of both. But it's a valid question. By whose authority are you doing this? And folks, in our world today, authority is just as important as it was then. Anyone can claim to be a preacher and teacher of the Word of God. Anybody can claim that. And they can have people who will give everything to follow them. I remember one particular false teacher who was exposed. And a lady said, well, I know they found out that stuff, but I just know he's from God. I know it right here in my heart. And I thought, you're so deceived. All of the evidence says he's a charlatan, but I like him, and I've liked him for years. Stop! No. I'm going to, in essence, ignorantly she is saying, I'm going to keep heading down this path of destruction because my affinity is for a personality, not for the book. Be careful about that. Be careful about that. John's answer, again, is very plain and to the point. You know, if you're not these, these significant characters, well, who are you? Why are you baptizing? And John says, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me. Now, when you look in Matthew chapter 3 as well as Luke, there's a little more added there to what John said. It's a contrast. I'm a man who knows the Lord, and I'm here to preach and to prepare you for the Messiah who's already on the scene, but now you're going you're to know who he is. I'm baptizing you in water. 
Water doesn't clean you actually, but it's symbolic of being ritually cleansed. But water can't wash away your sins. Only the blood of the Lamb of God can do that. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. The agents just change. Where I will baptize you in water, He will actually put you into the Holy Spirit, identify you into Him. That's a drastic contrast, but a necessary one. And then John does something that I love. This is the heart of John. He begins pointing the people away from himself and to the one who has finally arrived. Now, Jesus says this of John the Baptist, now, Jesus being the exception. Of men born to women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. Now, John was a sinner who needed a Savior, but of men born to women, none's greater than John the Baptist. What is the testimony of that John? There's one greater. And I'm trying to point you to him. Part of what I love about this here, you see the true heart of God in John, where sometimes preachers will get a crowd and it starts to become about them. Hey, people are coming to hear me. Hey, look, we got things rolling. Woo! I, I must be somebody. John doesn't do that. In fact, later, when his disciples notice, hey, they're starting to follow Jesus. John says, good. They should. He must increase. I must decrease. Oh, may that be the heart of your pastors forever in this church. That we seek to magnify Christ, not ourselves. We seek that you will not go out and tell people, oh, you've got to hear Brother Greg. Or, oh, you've got to hear Brother Daryl. Not that you would tell them, hey, don't come. But, but it's not the Greg and Daryl show. But that you would be able to say, hey, Come to our church if you're not going anywhere and come hear our pastors talk about the, the Christ. Come and hear our pastors talk about the exalted King of Kings. Come and behold the Lamb of God. <laughs> That's what I hope will be our, not just our words, but actually what we promote here in this fellowship. He's pointing people away from himself and to the one who is on the scene. And next week, Lord willing, in verse 29, we will see that Jesus is already there. And that's when we'll hear those magnanimous words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, I'm excited about that. But we're not there yet. This sermon is winding down. But I hope that you will come back for that one too. John the Baptist, and this is your application. John the Baptist was confronted by opposition with regard to what he was doing and why. Do you think John the Baptist knew the Old Testament? I don't mean just knew of it. Well, yeah, of course, he was a preacher. Let me tell you something. Before I was ever a preacher, I was learning the Old Testament. And I'm not saying that to shame anyone. But I get really frustrated when I hear people, well, you've just got to encourage these young people to get in the Word. I don't have to encourage them to get on social media. I don't have to encourage them to learn whatever subjects they're learning at school in the hopes that they'll get a job that pays them well. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic there. But why, why do they not need motivation for any of this other stuff? But when it comes to the Bible, oh, I'm just not motivated. Why would you not want to know the God who saved you and the book that he wrote? If that's not enough to motivate you to get in the Word daily, I don't know what will. Has God spoken? Yes. Do we have a copy of it? Yes. Is that enough to motivate you and me to get in the book? It is. If you want to be able to proclaim the Word of God rightly, even if it's not from a pulpit or a music stand, but you want to know the Word, to be able to know it for yourself, and to communicate the Word of God to people, to be able to share the Gospel clearly, then you've got to know the book. One of the issues that I've had with people wanting to emphasize testimony, look, I love to hear testimonies of people who've been saved, but one of, the, one of the dangers is this. The testimony quickly goes from how Jesus saved me to now I am the star of this story, and we left Jesus way behind. No, friend, the testimony of every believer is summed up in Christ has saved me. And Christ is the one getting the glory in this testimony. We need to know the book. 
John knew the book. The apostles knew the book. And the common people knew the book. Gospel proclamation, evangelism. But we also need to know it for apologetics. Apologetics is a word simply meaning an, a, a way of defending what you believe. 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, Be able to give a defense, an apologetic, to anyone who asks you concerning the hope that is within you. Do it with gentleness and reverence. But every Christian is to be able to give a response as to why you believe what you believe. Now, is a brand new Christian going to know that to the extent of a, of a brother or sister who's been walking with Jesus for four decades? No. But you need to start knowing and start building upon that. And when your coworker or when your family member asks you, why do you believe what you believe? I hope that you'll be able to say more than, well, I just know it in my heart. I know it because God said it, and I can show you where he said it, and I can actually tell you the storyline. That's what ought to be our, our ambition, is to know God's word and his storyline. Folks, on, and this is not a, a commercial, but every Sunday morning at 1030, we're meeting, and we have music that is, we're trying to point all of ourselves to the Lord and worship him. That's what the music is for. The preaching is trying to do the same thing. On Wednesday nights, yours truly is actually doing this a lot less formally. I'm, I'm actually, we're going through James and I'm writing the verses on the board and I'm getting a little more technical, but trust me, it's not a boring seminary course, but showing you this is how we understand the scriptures and this is how we apply it. Friend, if you want to know how to follow Christ, these are the things you need to invest in. Oh, okay, so I need to come to hear you preach on Wednesday. I'm not saying that, although I hope you will. And I don't know why a follower of Jesus would not want to be with the people of God. But you can't passively walk in Jesus and expect to grow. It will not happen. Be diligent in the studies of the Scriptures. And be diligent to listen to those who know how to teach them. To my family in Christ... Seems like a redundant question, but did you catch how much of the Old Testament is referred to in this passage today? Key figures such as the Messiah, Elijah, and the prophet are alluded to, and really even Moses because it's referring to the, the prophet. The Old Testament is far more than just intriguing stories. It's a story about a Messiah who was to come. The New Testament says he's here. Friend, I'm telling you, you're not David, so don't read 1 Samuel 17 to be a David who's a giant slayer. No, you're not David. You read 1 Samuel 17 to see that God raises up a deliverer and you need that deliverer. You don't need to be a David. You need to trust the greater David who is the Christ. Amen. But I, I just encourage you, get some type of reading plan. I usually go through the entire Bible each year. Now I'm trained enough and I've read it enough to where it does make a lot of sense to me, but that's taken years. And I don't have it all figured out, but I have a pretty good basis of understanding. This year, I'm not planning on reading the, through the entire Bible. I'm going to take it in a smaller section, but a more in-depth section. I'm talking about for my own personal reading. But folks, come and see me, or see Greg, if you're saying, you know what, I do want a, a, a plan on how to read and understand the Scriptures. Not just parts of them, but all of them. Friend, we'll help you, because you need it. God didn't write it so that we would later ignore it. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, but we need to grow in our understanding of why we believe this and why we should believe this and why it's trustworthy. Plenty of people believe things that aren't, aren't trustworthy. We believe that which is trustworthy. And our confidence is not a matter of feeling, although feelings are involved, but primarily it is a... It is a confidence based on knowing because God has spoken specifically in the Scriptures. To any of you who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never repented of your sins, you've never trusted Him to rescue you, I know how easy it is to, dis to dismiss the Bible because the popular notion is it's nothing more than another religious book full of myth and fairy tale and legend. Those are some of the claims, without a doubt, those claims are made. But are those claims valid? Well, my, my professor says that the Bible is mythology. 
Okay, is your professor right about everything? I simply challenge you, do some investigation. You're taking someone at their word or at their testimony. And friend, the testimony concerning Jesus isn't a simple matter for just here and now. It's a matter for eternity. You need to consider who you're listening to. And I know I've preached that multiple times and I will preach it still. But the Bible is not mythology. It is not fairy tale and legend. It is the actual revelation of God to humankind. And in that book, known as the Bible, you will find that there is a triune God who is holy and eternal. He made mankind in His image, but mankind sinned against Him. And we were hopeless because of it. But thankfully, no sooner than man sinned, God showed up and said, I'm sending someone. And He and only He can rescue you. And we believe that that person is Jesus of Nazareth. You say, can I really know someone who walked the earth 2,000 years ago? And Daryl, how do we even know he really walked? Friend, there are ev even skeptics who will say, if you do not think that Jesus of Nazar Nazareth was a real person, you don't really know much. Even unbelieving people will acknowledge he was a real person. Well, we're not simply asking you to acknowledge that he was a real person. We're asking you to consider the revelation that says he's a real person who claimed to be God and backed up his claim. And will you believe him? Pray with me now. Father, help us.